Hi, so today we will talk about hypochloridia and achloridia, uh, so about stomach issues. Uh, I have a whole video about gastritis, a uh, very detailed video about that, so I will put the link up there. Uh, please go watch that video too if you have this problem. I have a website, thecandidaslayer.com, where I have a course on how to heal your digestive system. Naturally, the link will be under this video in the description box. So here are a few studies uh, that I will also put in the descri description box under this video. Um, I uh, um, use these studies uh, to make uh, this video. So uh, what is hypochloridia? So hypochloridia is when you don't have enough acid in your stomach. It's when the pH is above 3. So uh, what is the pH? Uh, it's a scale to measure the acidity and the alkalinity. Okay, so it goes from 0 to 14, uh, neutral is uh, 7, under 7, the more you go towards 0, the more it is acidic, and the more you go towards the 14th, the more it is alkaline. Okay, so hypochloridia is when the stomach is not uh, acidic enough, uh, with a pH above 3. Achloridia, it's when there is there's no acidity at all, uh, it's at least uh, 7, so neutral to alkaline. So what is stomach acid? Stomach acid is produced by parietal cells that line the stomach wall. So we will see here what it is. Here you have uh, a picture of uh, the, the stomach uh, lining. And uh, here you have uh, what are uh, the uh, gastric glands. Okay, And um, if we zoom, here are the parietal cells. Okay. So I will come back uh, to this drawing uh, after. So stomach acidity is produced by the parietal cells that we just saw uh, that line the stomach wall. These cells have proton pumps which move hydrogen ions from the inside of the parietal cell into the stomach lumen against a concentration gradient. So here, proton pumps. It might uh, sound familiar because when uh, you have stomach issues, very often the doctor will give you proton pumps inhibitors and proton pump inhibitors they are also called anti uh, anti-acids okay so proton pumps inhibitors that comes from this so these cells have proton pumps which move hydrogen ions from the inside of the parietal cell into the stomach lumen against a concentration gradient these pumps secrete acid in response to three neurohumoral si uh, signals acetylcholine uh, gastrin and histamine Okay, so we will talk about that uh, later, but regarding histamine, I have uh, two main videos where I talk about histamine. I talk, of course, about histamine in my gastritis video, because in my gastritis video, I explain that histamine is um, needed for your stomach to make acidity. Okay, and I will tell you that here again. So histamine is important for your digestion. I also talk about histamine in my histamine intolerance video. Uh, so I explain why you have histamine intolerance, what is histamine, and usually people, when they think about histamine, they think it's something annoying that they need to suppress because histamine, uh, when they have histamine issues, they will have like symptoms like um, a runny nose and headaches and, and rashes and stuff like that, and they want to suppress histamine. But no, histamine is very important for many processes in the body um, and here is an example you need histamine for proper digestion if you suppress histamine you won't digest properly and you will have lots of issues because of that okay so the stomach acid is composed of hydrochloric acid potassium chloride and sodium chloride Okay, uh, the parietal cells lining the stomach are mainly involved in this in its production so here it gives us a hint about what does your body need to make um, uh, gastric acid? If you have hypochloridia, you want to, uh, to improve that by giving to your body what it needs to make acidity. So here you go, you need potassium and you need salt, sodium chloride. Uh, activation of pepsin is greatest at pH uh, at a pH of two uh, or less, and its protease uh, activity is optimal at a pH of uh, 1.8 to 2.3. So pepsin is an enzyme uh, that digests um, 
proteins. Okay, so here, here is the ideal uh, pH of your stomach. Um, roughly, it's between one and three. Okay, so this is very important to understand because very often when you will have, like when you have stomach issues, if you have GERD, if you have, um, if you have uh, gastritis, if you have uh, gastric ulcers, and you go to your doctor, your doctor will tell you, oh, it's because you have too much acidity in your stomach. Your stomach is too acid. No, it's not true. That's not the reason why you have these issues. Uh, your stomach needs to be very acidic. 1.8 or 1 or 1 1.8 is, is very, very acidic. And this is the normal acidity. You don't want uh, your stomach to have uh, a higher pH, but I will talk about that in the next slides. Um, yeah, so here again, you can see uh, the uh, gastric glands here, the parietal cells that uh, produce hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. This intrinsic factor is needed to uh, absorb vitamin B12. So people who have a very damaged uh, stomach, they will have tons of issues, and amongst them, they, will, they won't be able to absorb uh, B12. Uh, the chief seals secrete uh, pepsinogen, the inactive proenzyme form of pepsin, and HCL is necessary for the conversion of pepsinogen to pepsin. And the uh, enteroendocrine, uh, uh, sorry, enteroendocrine cells uh, that secrete many hormones, uh, amongst which gastrin in presence of amino acids in the stomach. Gastrin increases the secretion of the gastric glands, and it controls stomach emptying. And here is a picture of the stomach. Uh, it's not very important. I won't talk much about that. Uh, here is another picture because uh, I will talk about the sphincters. Okay, so here is the uh, gastroesophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter here. Uh, what is important to understand is that these sphincters, and especially we will talk about this one, um, they work, uh, they open and close depending on the pH that you have in your stomach. You need an acidic pH for the sphincter here to close, okay? And we will talk about that next. So what are the causes of hypochloridia or achloridia? First, the age. We will talk about that in a moment. So the, the older you are, uh, the more issues you will have. Uh, if you use anti-secretory medications and especially proton pump inhibitors, we talked about that earlier, the PPIs, that's, uh, of course, a cause of hypochloridia because what these medications do is they suppress your uh, gastric acidity. Antihistamines, so I just explained that. I won't explain that again. Um, deficiencies. Um, so as we saw before, your, you, you need sodium, chloride, and potassium to make HCL. Okay, so if you have um, these deficiencies, you won't be able to make HCL, so you will have hypo hypochloridia. Uh, also, calcium, you need calcium. Uh, calcium in particular uh, is necessary to the proper functioning of the stomach, stomach sphincters. Why? It's because the stomach sphincters are controlled by the autonomous nervous system. And so it means that you, you don't control it, and uh, it needs, so these are muscles. Okay, and the muscles to uh, function properly need main mainly calcium and magnesium. But of course, not only that, but I, I won't detail too much here. So you need calcium and magnesium. So if you have deficiencies in these minerals, you can have hypochloridia. H. pylori. Okay, if you have H. pylori, it can cause hypochloridia. So um, it's actually, it, <clears throat> it goes both ways. Um, you will have H. pylori infection if your stomach is not acidic enough. Um, and H. pylori um, uh, suppress the uh, acidity of your stomach. So it goes, it goes uh, both ways. So um, basically, H. pylori, everybody has H. pylori. The problem is only when you have too much of it. Uh, but I will make another video about that, so I won't detail that uh, here too much. If you have hypothyroidism, you can have hypochloridia because your thyroid controls many things in your body, including uh, the uh, proper functioning of your stomach. If you are anxious or very uh, stressed out, you can have hypochloridia because uh, it will, so these emotions, anxiety and stress disturb the autonomic nervous system. So it stops digestion, it stops normal activity of smooth muscles, 
the sphincters uh, I was talking about earlier, and it uh, disturbs uh, peristalsis. Peristalsis is the movement, um, the natural movement that makes your um, your food uh, move uh, in your body. Okay, and here are other uh, reasons, but uh, it's it's not as common. So who is at risk? Basically, it's all the people who do that, as we just said. Okay, so uh, old people, people who take uh, PPIs, people who take antihistamines, people following a bad diet and uh, who, uh, you know, get deficiencies, people who have H. pylori, uh, anxious and stressed people, people who have hypothyroid. Okay, so here is a little uh, drawing, a uh, little picture I found in one of the studies and it shows something very interesting. It shows that, so here are two groups of people, a group of young uh, adults and a group of old people. So the young people have about 25 years old and the old people about 70 uh, years old. So what is interesting here is that um, most people think that the problem is uh, during the, the fasting uh, period. They, they think like the old people will have a higher pH uh, during the fasting um, during a, a fasting time. But actually the problem is not during the, the fasting time. It's after, after the beginning of the meal. So here you see there's not much difference between the young people and the older people. They all have a pH between one and two, two and a half maximum and then start the meal. So of course the pH... Uh, uh, increases because, um, of course, uh, the, the food that people absorb will dilute, dilute the uh, acidity of the stomach. So it's normal, the pH goes up. But then the problem here you see is that the young people, the, their pH goes down very quickly. Like within one, two hours, it's back to what it was before the meal. But it's not the case for the older people. The older people will keep a very high pH during the whole time of the meal. And that's why they will have issues digesting their meals. So what are the symptoms or the consequences of hypochloridia? Um, all of these, uh, epigastric pain, weight loss, heartburn. I won't read all of them. Uh, you can pause and, and read. But the main ones are the ones um, in, in bold. Um, of course, uh, pain around the stomach area, heartburn, bloating, early satiety, uh, postprandial fullness, um, dysphagia, burping, GERD, uh, SIBO, C. diff, or other uh, types of dysbiosis, food, food allergies or food intolerances, slow gastric emptying, nutritional deficiencies, poor uh, protein digestion. Here are more details. I won't read that. I just uh, took these um, extracts from the different studies. So you can pause and read if you want. Um, here I wanted to uh, talk about, uh, to, to talk a little bit about the uh, acid reflux. Acid reflux is not caused by excess acidity, quite the opposite. So I wanted to, um, to focus on that because, again, many doctors will get it wrong like you go see a doctor because you have acid reflux and what they will do they will tell you it's because your stomach is too acidic and they will t give you anti-acids this is not how it works so basically you will have food you know acid stuff coming back up your esophagus because the sphincter here stays open so the question to ask is why does the sphincter stays open this is the real question because see if they give you ppis the only thing it will do so if they give you ppis the uh, the food will will keep going up it won't solve the issue of the sphincter that is open here so things will keep going up the only difference is that it won't be acidic anymore so it won't burn your esophagus okay so you will you will feel you will find some relief but it will just create more issues in the long run because, as we said, PPIs um, cause hypochloridia. Okay, so I will tell you why the sphincter stays open. The sphincter stays open because your stomach is too alkaline. It's not acidic enough. When the stomach is acidic enough, the sphincter receives the signal that is it, it is um, acidic, so it closes. It closes when the pH is correct. It stays open when the pH is not correct. So by giving you PPIs, you will the doctor will give you some temporary relief with your symptoms, but 
on the long run, it will create tons and tons of issues. Okay, so uh, acid reflux can be caused by an erratic or weak lower esophageal sphincter. We just explained why. Uh, pressure uh, from abdominal fat, so that can happen like uh, for um, obese people, especially when they lay down on their back, um, the fat uh, on their belly will push the, uh, the, the stomach. And it's like when you do that with a balloon, of course, it will, <laughs> it will uh, make this part of the stomach uh, blow up and it will open the, uh, the sphincter. Um, if you have hiatal hernia or bile reflux, okay, this is another thing that most people don't think about. So here, basically, this is the beginning of your small intestine and here in that area, you have the, the liver and the gallbladder. So the gallbladder will release bile that goes here in the small intestine and it's supposed to go down. But if there's a problem with your um, gallbladder, the bile instead of going down will come, uh, will, will go back up. Here it will pass through this sphincter and goes into your stomach and it can even go up there in your esophagus and cause acid reflux. Okay. So um, if you have this issue, you have to do something for your uh, gallbladder. And I will talk about that in, in a moment. Uh, yeah, so it is common to confuse reflux symptoms from hyperchloridia when the symptom may actually be associated with hypochloridia. So it would be great if doctors would, um, you know, um, keep up to date and read um, studies because it's, it's, it's unbelievable that they still give PPIs to people who have acid reflux. So how to test for hypochloridia? I won't uh, read everything, so you can pause if you want the details. Um, anyway, it's not. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to do these tests because the symptoms alone are uh, more than enough to know if you have hypochloridia. Okay, so go back to the symptoms here, and the ones in bold is especially, uh, you know, the symptoms you will have when you have hypochloridia. Okay, poor protein digestion. Of course, you can digest your proteins if you have hypochloridia. Um, slow gastric emptying, uh, food allergies, intolerance, SIBO, GERD, burping, bloating, heartburn, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so um, these symptoms alone, you know, will tell if you have hypochloria or not. So I, I would not av advise to do all these crazy tests. Uh, to me, they are uh, not... Um, they are not useful and uh, they can even be dangerous. So now the treatment, it's very easy. Um, so basically you want to do natural things, of course, as always, uh, that's always what I recommend. So uh, basically bitter plants, bitter herbs can really help because the bitter taste in your mouth will activate your digestive organs. It will activate your stomach to produce more acid. It will activate your um, gallbladder to release bile uh, and it will activate your pancreas to release enzymes. So bitter plants, bitter herbs, like a bitter tea, a very bitter tea, uh, a few minutes before your meals will really help. Uh, you can also take betaine HCL. Uh, betaine HCL is basically acid in a pill. So if you have a lack of acid in your stomach, that's the best thing you can do. You take a, a few pills of uh, betaine HCL. Uh, I might make another video to explain how to do that, how to take it. Uh, you can also take uh, apple cider vinegar uh, or so a few uh, tablespoons of apple cider vinegar or of um, lemon juice in a little bit of water with a pinch of salt and a piece of ginger. And you drink that a few minutes before your meals that will be really helpful. It will acidify your stomach and it will, um, again, like bitter plants, it will stimulate your digestive organs. So you don't need to do both. Huh? You, you choose either bitter plants, either ACV. Um, you know, you can try both, but not at the same time. And you see which one works better for you and, and, you, and you keep uh, doing this one. Uh, I mean, the one that works for you. Uh, you can take digestive enzymes. I really recommend that people who have um, stomach issues take digestive enzymes. It's very important. It will help you digest what you eat. Chew really well, okay? Chew very, very well until it's liquid. You don't want to swallow unless it's completely liquid. Don't overeat, okay? So 
I see that often um, with people who have gastric issues. They just eat a lot, a lot, a lot. And, you know, these people usually, they have been doing that for years. So to them, it's normal to eat a lot. And they don't, they actually don't even realize that they, they eat too much. It's just like how they do. And they always did. But so if you have uh, stomach issues, think about that. Do you overeat? If you do, eat less. You need to eat until satiation, but not more than that. Um, get away from stress. Okay, as we said, stress is, uh, is really one of the main causes of gastric issues. And eat in a quiet environment. Okay, Have a good diet. It's important. A good healthy diet without processed food, without coffee and stuff like that. Alcohol, that's very bad. Uh, again, go watch my gastritis video. Uh, I have more details about the diet. And uh, you can also take bile salts if you also have issues digesting uh, fats. Because as we said before, if you have issues with your bile, with your uh, gallbladder, uh, then it can, you know, worsen your um, hypochloridia, um, hypochloridia and it can, it can worsen your acid reflux. Okay, so you want to do both uh, taking acidic uh, things, beta HCl or ACV, and also bile salts if you feel that you also have issues digesting fats. Okay, that's it for today. I hope this video helps. Uh, again, I have a course on how to heal your digestive system naturally. The link will be under the video. I see you in the next video. Bye-bye.